Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. It was a lovely introduction. And most appreciated that you have given us a really excellent foundation from which all of us will share our design research, theory, and practice in different cases. I'm really pleased to be here. I recall as I walked in, I know this room. I stood here in March of 2020 speaking to you about water-based urbanism. And I did not know that I would be stuck in my house for the next few years, uh, like most of you. So it is a real pleasure to be back here. And in particular, this time, to share some more recent work with you, to see some familiar faces and new friends. So thank you very much for the invitation. It's an honor to be here. My name is Nina Marie Lister, as it was introduced. I'm an ecologist first, uh, planner, trained as a planner, and also more recently at the intersection of landscape and urbanism. And you're going to hear some shared projects that combine these. In fact, when Stefan invited me, I initially thought, well, shouldn't I be talking more to the ecological urbanism group? But I realized, you know what, that work is very interdisciplinary and it slides comfortably between landscape and the material world of ecology on which it is based. So that is where I'm going to begin. I want to share with you the work of Wild Ways. This is a decade long project in my research lab at Toronto Metropolitan University, which used to be called Ryerson, so that has moved, but rather the university has changed names in acknowledgement of our colonial past and the center of Toronto. This work is really about structuring landscape from a specifically designed point of view for the purpose of engaging landscapers in ecology, the material quality, the building blocks of landscape, if you will. And it is intentional in an urban context, even though some of the images you will see may surprise you. They may not be images in your city, but I assure you they are images in the global city. Uh, my ecological design lab at TMU engages three kind of connected pillars of research. We are focused on connecting landscapes so that we do not have isolated patches of green, but rather connected places for movement, safe passage for humans and wildlife. That includes plants, by the way. We also work on the forms of that landscape connectivity, so green and blue infrastructures, purpose designed infrastructure to connect. And protect people, wildlife. And then, of course, resilience, adaptability, and resilience is another pillar of that research. How these landscape infrastructures contribute to resilience under climate change and biodiversity loss. And, of course, for many of us, the human suffering that will ensue in places that are vulnerable. So, we no longer talk in our lab about just climate change or global heating or biodiversity loss. We talk about all three of these at the poly crisis global heating, biodiversity loss, and human suffering. These are interconnected fundamentally, and our work is really at the nexus of these three through the design of landscape. And I think it's a very good rationale for that. A lot of the published work that came out of our lab in the last 10 years is available in text for landscape architects, but also in scientific journal papers. And I want to draw some attention that the work of ecology begins in the field. And there is a pillar of work in our lab through students in biology and ecology that is always engaged in the field. We work in a very hands-on way with the living material of landscape, more than human design, design for other species. So we work in ornithological research adjacent to ornithology to understand how and why and where animals move. We can't understand landscape connectivity without understanding patterns of movement. Patterns of movement that relate to place and that relate to our relationship with other species. We work with students in the field on summer research, for example. This is a research station that we look at every summer on the survivability and adaptability of breeding bird populations in the northern Great Lakes. Uh, we work in the nighttime with movement of owls. These are barred owls and sawwhite owls that traverse through our area of the Great Lakes. Uh, we look at plumage studies, mold studies, so that we understand how and where these populations are moving and where they are most at risk, so that we can translate that knowledge into design. 
recently in the Galapagos, we ran a field research course with architecture students, not landscape architecture students, but architecture students. Why are they interested? Well, for me, working together with Professor Julia Cernia and Ted Brown of Syracuse, we were able to do a transdisciplinary study of how wildlife moved so that architects could engage in design for living world, not just build form for humans, but actually infrastructures to assist and move and support species at risk. Some of them, of course, like the giant tortoise, very iconic, and many who have outlasted us. This tortoise is at least 120 years old. That's the documented record, but probably much older. Imagine deep time designed for species that far exceed your own life, designed for the oldest trees among them. We also engage with species that have a connection with humans in sometimes a surprising way. The Galapagos, of course, famous for its sea lions by studying the intersection of the sea lions and humans and how they have to work and live side by side, sometimes in conflict with a protected species, leads to interesting opportunities for design. Design sometimes for separation and sometimes for coexistence. In all cases, we are having students document and understand movement. These are sketches by architecture students, not ecologists, not landscape architecture students, but real-time field work that's shown in a very deliberate way how movement happens and how we observe and intersect with these species with whom we can't speak like a regular client, but who have needs that we can help them. We also do this in the field using both primary and secondary research. So sometimes we're observing, other times we're using other ecologists' published research in a secondary format so that we understand how wildlife move from a design point of view here. The movements of grizzly bears across and over highways in Canada's west. This is only 35 minutes outside of metropolitan area of Calgary. It's very much a landscape-based urban project. This research is done mostly by Tony Clevenger, and our lab uses the research data by camera traps to understand how wildlife move so that we can design together with them. And for them, um, this is very much a co-creative initiative. We can't do this without the evidence of the wildlife themselves. In this case, you're seeing the grizzly bear mother, a sow, teach her young how to move across the highway. And in this case, you're seeing that we have species at risk here at Mountain Lion. We also have pelican in the bottom viewer's right-hand corner you see a wolf, and that wolf is smart enough to know we're looking. Oh, it's a PDF. In the PowerPoint, the bear is moving. In any case, these images from the camera traps provide us with real-time data so that we can translate these into connected green infrastructural designs for safe passage. That's the emphasis of the Wild Ways Project, but you'll see that this work has taken us from theory to praxis to practice and it engages in a definitely worth of work that I'll share with you in different contexts. Underlying all of this work is the image of the infrastructure within a city, built by and for humans primarily, and yet with a greater understanding at this moment that the non-humans around us provide us not only with the service, but have intrinsic value themselves. So when you look at this image of my city in Toronto, what do you see? Do you see an architecture of built form? Do you see a cultural landscape? Do you see a natural landscape? The answer, of course, is that when we learn to see, we see both, and not either or. And that's the basis that we talked about that Stephen presented from landscape urbanism that drives most of the research in my lab. We encourage people within the research we do, and always, to think and see differently. So that when we look at wildlife as beings that need our support and that support us, in a co-creative way, we learn to see differently. We document by watching in the field. We gather research that is empathetic, that is compassionate in origin, not merely objective and distanced, but understanding creatures with needs of their own. And this means that we engage in our research sensing, perception, feelings and understanding about these other species that are so important at this moment. And most of all, that we can connect and relate to other species, not simply extract from them a needed purpose or an economic value. And that is a major shift we're seeing right now in research around landscape architecture in particular, and even in field ecology as well. So all of this work is centered in the notion that biodiversity goes beyond just providing 
research and design to help species survive. None of us wants really to survive. We want to flourish in the world, and that is where these designs are originating. So when we're doing our research that underlies the projects you'll see, I hope what you take away from this is that what we see in this work determines what we value. And what we value is what we choose to save or protect. But most of all, it's how we relate. How do we relate to others around us? This is not just about wildlife, of course. It's about different people, about different cultures. So if we can do this kind of work for wildlife, we can also do it for people. This is something that's most familiar to us, I think, and it's also incredibly important as a theoretical underpinning of design. What can designers do with this research? What can we do in a moment of a public crisis? Climate change, global heating, human suffering, vulnerability. What can we do? It's overwhelming. Well, we'd all, always argue in our lab and through the teams of research that we've worked with that we design for more than just humans. In an indigenous practice, this is called two-eyed seeing or also open-heartedness. These are, I would say, contemporary underpinnings of good design that we design with care and with empathy for the world, not merely, again, for extracted value. And we also design for coexistence together and apart from wildlife where it is safe for all, but also for kin to understand that our wildlife relationships in most of the world have been fractured and are distant from us, sometimes for good reason, but mostly not. This is about making kin and making relations. So we talk about this using an indigenous term, at least in the culture where I work, it is part of a reconciliation moment. We talk about designing for all our relations not just for however much economic value we can take from a place, but for making a relationship. And the reestablishment of that relationship allows us to value and care for what is around us. And that's a really important piece of this work. It also allows us to see our cities as living beings themselves in the large, largest sense. So think about design and with biodiversity specifically, and in a more general way, for nature nature in the city or green cities, as we sometimes call them. Think about this as a connection to nature that we all seek in some way. We are primordially connected to it, even if we're distanced from it. So this work is about relating to nature. And then finally, I'll just zero in for a moment. The research focus in the projects I'm going to show you quite quickly are really in this uh, way to fr be framed around landscape connectivity. First, this is about advancing resilience in urban regions because we're looking at the functional connection between landscapes so that non-human species, as well as humans, can have the freedom to roam and to move safely. It means that a resilient culture is one in which habitats for humans and non-humans or wildlife are both and part of the city's infrastructure. It also means that design for connectivity means a living and green infrastructure that's purposely planned, purposely planned investment through which we have designed solutions. And then as a premise, we would say that connectivity means that everyone has the right to run, the freedom and safety to move. We call this safe passage in the, in the specific area of design I work in. And then finally, these connections, materially and specifically designed, happen at multiple scales and speeds. You saw the image of a giant tortoise. That's a very deep time creature, very slow moving, very purposeful. When the tortoise walks into the road, you're not moving past it quickly. When a smaller an insect or pollinators are moving, they're moving so quickly it's hard to photograph them. So we are also thinking about speed and scale while we're designing. This research partnership Again, a decade-long project that has had two large partnership grants sponsored by the Canadian federal government. This is our Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, as well as our Natural Sciences Council. We have five different university partners in six cities, and this research has just um, concluded, but continues in the academy. Just very quickly, I'll say that the methodological framework for this research is both transdisciplinary and co-creative, using some of the, the premises that you heard from Stefan earlier. We use design-based workshops in all of the cities with which we work, where we are working together with people on the ground to develop design solutions based on the data. Uh, and this data cover a number of sectors, from engineering to architecture to ecology to road ecology and transport, particularly where roads are concerned. 
All of these methods and workshops have happened in the cities that we're partnered with. I'll just cover a couple of them very quickly to give you a, a sample, if you like. We also, in each of these cases, have developed a system of assets where we're looking at the knowledge base of each community that, that has historically been separated into knowledge silos. What we're doing is covering that research in a, in a kind of bridging way to bring together people from across the disciplines to integrate the knowledge to create solutions or co-create solutions that are very specific to the place, but at the same time have some scalability. We also have pilot tested a number of visualization and built strategic interventions. So this is a research method that has been developed through these collaborative activities in different cities and is now translating into specific built designed projects. So in that way, this work translates from theory to praxis to actual built practice. And at the next stage of our work is to actually perform and evaluate some of these. We began with pilot tests that had been initiated by our partner cities, in this case, the city of Edmonton in northern central Canada. This city is well known for having developed the very first set of municipal wildlife infrastructure designs. So designs to move large wildlife, in this case, particularly bears, large horn sheep, um, cougars in some cases, through the city fabric itself. And this Bridges are specifically designed for wildlife movement, in this case, under the roadway as well as over top. And it's very unusual to see guidelines developed by a city. This is one of the first in the world to do this, and it's also the first city in Canada to become part of the International Biophilic Cities Network. In all of the outcomes that we've worked on, our strategies have included communications, helping to share in a very general way with the public, broadly speaking, why and how these kinds of infrastructures are important. And we do so with visualization, using the tools and techniques that landscape architects are well known for, which is the design communication, being able to show visually how these designs work. So the design praxis, uh, just to take you back a little bit, is rooted in the idea that we are in a crisis and we have a moment of opportunity to engage deeply in this work. We should also be testing our solutions in a way that allows them, when they fail, to do so safely. So they're not tested at such a large scale, but as a specific project in different locations that can be adapted and grow as we learn from it. This research to the IPBS, of course, is part of that premise, showing us that we're in a biodiversity crisis. We know recently at the COP convention in December last, um, our lab was a partner in this convention. We saw the release of the new global biodiversity framework. I want to emphasize that the targets here are 30% protected land and water by 2030. That's a big change from the last uh, Convention on Biological Diversity, which was only 17%. We came nowhere near to meeting that, of course. And so I wonder how we're going to meet 30%, but this is part of this. This is part of the, tra the trajectory of the research is to get there. I was also part of the delegation for the state of California. And I put this out there because California is, of course, not a nation state, it is a state. However, as a sub-regional government, it had a lot to say at the Global Convention on Protecting Biodiversity, in part because the United States is not a signatory member. This is important because it's possible that at the municipal and regional level, we can still engage materially and functionally in landscape designs for biodiversity. We have to do that. We can't wait for national governments to move. We also know that part of this convention understands that intrinsic right to survive is part of the motivation for protection. We know that biodiversity, animals have their own rights, and we're recognizing those. In fact, rivers have rights now. Two rivers in Canada are also recognized as persons, along with the Fundamental River in New Zealand. So this is changing the way we think and the way we practice, I'd argue, for the better including understanding that nature in the urban century is at a crossroads. More and more our cities are on a direct collision course with some of the hottest biodiversity spots on the planet. We can see some of them lit up at night in this wonderful image. And in Richard Weller's work, he did a lovely job of mapping in the Atlas for the End of the World where we see disconnection and the need for connectivity. While as humans on the viewer's left, we're very connected. We've made roads and bridges and tunnels and pipelines and sewers, connections for people all the time. But in the process, we've isolated to the left and fragmented 
those areas that were intended for the protection of nature. But we can't survive without connection. And that's why landscape connected infrastructure is so critical. In a lot of the work, we've been relying on research that maps these complex zones between where cities are spreading or moving out and biodiversity is in hot decline. We can see it materially in some of our cities. Here in the region of Canmore in Canada, it is not uncommon to have breeding elk in your neighborhood. This is neither safe for people nor for elk. And at the same time, these beings have been here long before us, and they are, in the most material way, all of our relations. Similarly, these images that we see in a somewhat humorous way are not humorous for the wildlife that find themselves out of place, dark, unable to move, short of paying their fare. We see them in Quebec in underpasses. We see them in Nairobi at the outsets of the city. This is not the image you think of when you think of wild creatures in Africa, and yet it is becoming much more normal to see this kind of juxtaposition. Similarly, the wild cats in Mumbai, we also have them in Canada's West. We have bears outside our city. All of this goes to remind us that the road making, for example, that we're engaged in, runs right through the heart of these areas that are ostensibly protected for wildlife. So what can we do? We've been talking about reweaving the road. If the length of the world's roads here is projected to increase by more than 60% by 2050, we know we have a design challenge, how to cross the road safely. And that's what this research is about. How do we engage in landscape, material, design, infrastructure to connect these spaces for wildlife? And part of that is because of this emphasis on uh, roading areas. We know that these kinds of images are more common. We also have them at grade in our city. Some of these images just drew up my city alone on our waterways, under our ravines and corridors. So not just bridging and tunneling technologies, but corridors and greenways are also becoming more important part of this research. We started even by mapping the areas that are signed where we do draw attention to drivers on the road to maybe slow down, take a look, but this isn't doing anything other than bringing awareness, even if it's in the language, uh, local languages here in um, Shnabek in the province of Ontario. One of the first solutions that the Netherlands is very familiar with these, you have more than 50 crossings, mostly for red deer in the Netherlands, but we're using the same technologies here for a much larger suite of species in Banff. Again, this does not look like an urban area, but it's 30 minutes outside Calgary on the Trans-Canada Highway, which is a national highway across the country. This is an area where standing under that bridge, you will photograph license plates from all across the country. It's absolutely urban, even though the fabric of the landscape doesn't feel like it. And these are the prototypes that we used in 2008 to gather data to understand how could we make these structures more prototypical? Could we take this prototype and make them lighter, more adaptable? Could they be flexible? Could they be made from different materials? And could we allow greater movement of wildlife? We ran a design competition in 2010 from across the competitors across the world, including the Netherlands team. And this is what sparked the partnership research grant we did. Some of these solutions looked at things like thin shell concrete, where you could use one form at multiple scales, repeating it. Could we design a landscape itself that could be modular? Could it extend both from tunnel to surface? And that, of course, is the MVDA project. We published this research in a number of different venues, and I emphasize this only because that was the research stage that allowed extrapolation into other places. This was the modular bridge that was developed out of that research in Yoho National Park in Canada, a more rural location, but using the same adaptable modular technology, which is now, um, what I would say, standard over the last five years as these crossing sites have grown. Most recently, we engaged with the state of California and the city of Los Angeles to design the world's largest supercrossing. Of course, if it's in Los Angeles, it has to be a supercrossing. Uh, it also has to be privately funded. And this was an $85 million structure for which $100 million was raised by the National Wildlife Federation. We were engaged as a research partner and a technical team, and the design is by Living Habitats and Robert Rock, formerly of MBDA. And of course, this is an iconic structure for an iconic creature. This cougar was known as P-22. He recently 
passed away. He died after at the ripe old age of 12, um, which is about five years longer than any recorded wild cougar in the area. Why? Well, he wasn't in a zoo, but he kind of was. He was stuck in the city of Los Angeles in Griffith Park, unable to cross the 16 lane road. It spanned his fair chart. He never made it and so never broke. But he was an icon. And he raised, you know, he helped to raise the money to build this structure that he himself would never use. Um, but it's an important image. It was one that was used to open hearts, open wallets, and raise awareness of the need for wildlife around a metropolitan area that is certainly not associated with the natural landscape. But yet this landscape is an extremely rare one. It is one of the world's floristic kingdoms. It's very specific. The Mediterranean flora that appears in the Los Angeles area exists nowhere else, despite having the name Mediterranean. Uh, there's certainly a lot of invasive species, but the chaparral and the particular ecosystems here are unique. Um, we took this research into practice with our partners and had the, frankly, the joy of being there on groundbreaking day last year on Earth Day. So this is, for me, where the research translation into practice really matters. The success of this bridge will be important. The monitoring will be important. And the monitoring is also critical to the design. When we do this type of design work, we build in a monitoring and evaluation system so that we know who's using these crossings. How are we observing them? And that includes an awful lot of community science. We used to call this citizen scientists, but it's now community science, understanding that you could be from anywhere and still be evaluating this work contributing your data through an electronic upload system or one of many crowdsourced platforms that have gained reputable status, I would say, over the years. eBird being one of them, iNaturalist being another, Roadwatch being another. These are all ways for community members to show us who is moving where and to reveal those creatures that are typically hidden in plain sight. And yet what we provide safe passage they don't, it doesn't have to be the $100 million project. This is the conversion of an old hydro corridor. It's a hydro corridor, but by any other name, it's been rebranded as the Meadowway in Toronto, a 16 kilometer line, green line that runs through vulnerable and priority neighborhoods. Neighborhoods where people do not have access to green nature. And yet, by allowing this area to regenerate as an understory, a meadow, because it is under hydro lines, it's also turns out to be a very important movement corridor for a number of species of wildlife, including the eastern coyote, otherwise known as the koi wolf. This is also an important public project. It's funded in part by a foundation to kickstart this $25 million, but over now it has 20 kilometers of trails through 34 neighborhoods. This is also an important piece of green connected tissue that runs diagonally through a city that was previously um, a green desert, you might say. This is now something that's part and parcel of our research partnership. Much of the work in this partnership is now driven by a group called ARC, the Animal Road Crossing Project. You can read more about it at arc.ca, arcsolutions.ca, or org, rather. The emphasis in this research partnership is to translate uh, and mobilize the research data into infrastructural solutions. Through our lab, we provide design com competency, but these organizations have together really helped. The emphasis now in the lab is really looking at animal architecture of its own type to understand how we can engage as a community in better design. The last uh, piece of that work that I want to share quickly with you is the Wild Away Studio and Seminar that has come out of these transited projects. We've been working with the city of Los Angeles through the what's now called the Wallace Annenberg Wildlife Crossing, the super crossing. I can never say that without smiling a bit. Our students, this is at the Harvard University's Graduate School of Design. We launched both a research seminar and a design studio for architecture, landscape architecture, planning, and urban design students. This is a transdisciplinary design studio asking questions about how we engage with green infrastructure for safe passage. But we asked students to look at a city that might surprise you, and that's Los Angeles. We focused this work there through the last two years. My teaching partner, Chris Reed, and I developed this studio in tandem with the city of Los Angeles, the National Wildlife Foundation, and ARC, my research partner in my lab. 
This is another example where we've worked in research into practice and now back into design research to look to improve and elevate these designs, not only for landscape connectivity, but for people, for social ecological connectivity. And we asked the students in this particular iteration of the studio specifically to think not just about reconnecting landscapes, but to ask them to contemplate going from dysfunctional landscapes to resilient landscapes as a broad mandate. But more specifically, with wildlife, can we go to a design that actually foster coexistence? Can we relate to wildlife as kin in places where you would not expect us to work that way? And of course, the same question of survival to flourishing. Students looked at the mouth of the Marina del Rey, for example. They looked at reintroducing a more naturalized mouth to an area that is really devoid of a lot of um, organisms that you would typically see at the Riverine Estuary. The student worked particularly, this is Chang Liu's work, she worked at the looking at the relationship between the sea lion, the California sea lion and kelp bass, and what would a harbor look like if you rehabilitated the connections between these species in a very busy beach and harbor. Tom Day and Jesse Pan looked at the relationship between owls and ground squirrels, ground squirrels who are routinely poisoned for digging up people's front yards. But if you change the way we thought about the front yard and designed for the relationship between the squirrel and the owl, even though this is a city with busy power lines and corridors, when they looked at architecture that survived, that would provide for both. Um, the ground squirrels also considered in Jesse's work here, red-tailed hawk. These are all images that show you how the students began to think about connectivity through the lens of non-humans. Connectivity to place, to habitat, and to the relationship with people. Here in Cynthia's work, the relationship between mule deer and an ecosystem that is regenerating within the San Fernando Valley. Or at the tiniest scale, just the size of your baby fingernail, a butterfly, the El Segundo blue butterfly, which is on the U.S. endangered species list, that miraculously somehow exists just outside LAX on the beach dunes, but it needs a particular kind of plant. And the relationship between Aragonium latifolium with this species provided for a unique landscape that could actually be a series of front yards and backyards across a small neighborhood. And finally, returning to the Galapagos, our architecture students, we haven't forgotten about them. They looked at the unique relationship of the Galapagos sea lion with the sea wall that was put in place in San Cristobal in Galapagos and discovered that the seawall, while taken over and colonized by the sea lion, was not in fact the best infrastructure for them. So they, in, they inferred a variety of infrastructures that would mediate that relationship, allowing the sea lions a place to relax, bathe, breed, mate, and, and give birth, actually, while at the same time providing a place for humans. What this research centers on in all facets is the understanding that the ideas of nature are changing. In some cases, our ecosystems are novel. We have hybridized species like the koi wolf in my area of Ontario, species that do very well around humans, others that are disappearing. How we can bridge those spaces has very much to do with understanding the kind of post-wild world we are in and understanding that we benefit, we benefit when we use two-eyed seeing, open-hearted thinking, and we connect to a world we lost. Even in the ideas of rewilding popular here in Europe, less so in North America, the emphasis on understanding that we're not restoring, but we're re-engaging and reaffirming relationships with ideas of the wild and with species that have every, have every right to be and to flourish because they are, like everyone else, all of our relations. Thanks very much. I look forward to the conversation with you. Do you want questions now or later? So thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Are there any questions? Really inspiring. I'm sure you have some questions. Or you can get one. Oh, 
Pardon, au centre. Hello. Yes, you were our last speaker in this room for two years. So you were remembered so vividly for long. And thank you again. It was super, super interesting and inspiring. Um, we were having this, this discussion about the term rewilding. Let's be to uh, we say this all merged, but yeah, can you still is wild still the right word? Is rewilding because then sometimes maybe get the idea of oh we're going back to what you just said not to the say the the the, the former situation as a new situation. So yeah, how can you also make understand that this rewilding is about a new relationship? Well, I love this question. Um, that was exactly the research question that underpinned their advanced graduate seminar that was held in tandem with the studio. We asked the question, is there still a wild and does it matter? What are the qualities and the attributes of wildness, wilderness, and the wild? And I don't know enough about how these words translate into other languages, but I know that in the indigenous languages in what is called Canada, there is no word for wild. There's a word for relationship. Wild, historically, at least in English, is very much a colonial word. It expressed something of that was other. And othering has, I would say, done a lot of damage uh, to, uh, to us as human cultures, but also to wildlife, from which benefit has typically been extracted and taken. So some would argue that the word wild, to overcome that breach or that barrier, we need to get rid of it. Others would say that other species, non-humans, and I don't know why we define them as not being human. We're human. I would simply say other species. Other species, I'm not sure how they perceive us, uh, but they're not human. So they have presumably some self-determination and some ability to exist without us. In many cases, they don't need us. They don't need us at all. So maybe that's wild. I'm not sure I'd get rid of the word, but I might redefine what it is as species that don't need us. They self-determine. And it may be that our designs are really more about our relationship with them. And that's, I think, a way forward that helps. We had some very illuminating debates in my studio and in my seminar. I had the great privilege of having three different Indigenous people in the group themselves who offered insights from their communities. I had people, I think, from 13 different countries out of 21 students. And so we had really, I think, productive and co-creative thinking about what it is to relate to other species. And we were able to at least move past this idea that somehow we're in charge and we have to build something for wildlife. Most of them do just fine without us. But it's really more for us. And by building relationships to the other, we build more humanity for ourselves. So. One suggestion, maybe, for everybody. Um, I'm reading a book that's taking some time. <laughs> and it's called The Spell of the Sensuous. It's about Abram, oh no, David Abram. And it's exactly told from a more anthropological perspective. I think it's really a nice one for everyone to read. That's a great suggestion. Uh, we're always building our reading list, so thank you. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. 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 Can some time to think about it? Please, we have time. I have 15 minutes. So yeah, 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 sure. He's an order. Okay. So, Hi, thank you for the presentation. It was really interesting for me. It's a topic uh, that really interested me. I have a question. I don't know if it's a question, I'm sure, but I'm Italian. Um, in the northern part of Italy, we are now experiencing a problem, let's say, with the white bears. Uh, so the population is growing a lot, which is very good. At the same time, the urban pressure of the cities around is creating a big conflict. So last year, for the first time, a bear killed a man, and that was the huge uh, discussion now uh, about the controlling of the bears, and, uh, and also I think the major problem besides, of course, a missing link uh, at the green infrastructure is also 
uh, a lack of, in my opinion, of communication with the people there. So I was wondering, in your lab, uh, how do you experience this kind of situation? If there is a moment uh, in which you also talk and um, share, educate the people that live in this conflict area, and uh, how you work with this kind of situation uh, with the people itself, because sometimes really this is uh, missing. Uh, I understand that, like for the farmers in that area that they found all their cows killed, it's a problem for them. Same time. Uh, yeah. Very, uh, good it's a great question. <laughs> it's a real question and it's a real uh, issue yeah. for sure. Um, it sounds very romantic and nostalgic to talk about uh, making kin with a predator, but I can assure you, you are a much more respectful human being when you see a predator up close and you understand that. Our designs influence both their movement and our safety. So the interesting thing about the wildlife crossing infrastructure in particular is that it is always designed for two clients, for wildlife and for people to be kept separate. It's not actually about us engaging with one another directly in conflict. When we hit an animal on a road, that's the clear, it's a, well, of course, a literal collision, but it's also a sign of that conflict. And I can assure you, nobody hits an animal and wants to do it. At least it's very rare. How many of you have ever hit an animal on the car? Can you just, can you raise your hand? I mean, it depends where you're driving. You would see many more hands go up if you were asking this question in Eastern Canada. Uh, but enough of you have. It's traumatic, yeah? It's extremely, it's horrible. Yeah. We did it, one of the first things we did was a survey to understand wildlife human conflict. And people are traumatized by, I mean, if they survive the impact, they are traumatized, I can really promise you that. So it sticks with us as conflict that we need to resolve. When we're doing the wildlife crossing work, it's relatively easy because we are looking at keeping ourselves separate but together. So providing freedom to roam and place to move, but not in a way that engages directly. And partly because some of the projects I've shown you are for large-bodied uh, wildlife. Many of them are predators that are either apex predators like the mountain lion, or we call them cougars. Um, they are think by a number of names, or, or grizzly bear and brown bear, black bear. We have black bears in the east, grizzly bears in the, in the west. I am thrilled that the adult population of bears has is resurging along with wolves. But these are species that were driven out of Europe for many good reasons. And we're now having to remake that relationship. And it absolutely begins with education and with respect, respect for the other. We have excellent research coming out of California on coexistence. Coexistence is a cumbersome word in my view in English. I don't know what words you use to express this, if they have the same meaning. But coexistence should suggest the respect for the other to thrive and survive as well as yourself. So that means separate but together. We learned a lot in our workshops with Anishinaabeg people in the eastern part of Canada, who, as an emblem of peace and uh, treaty, use something called the two-row wampum belt that has always been explained to me as two lines in a belt that show the separate movement of peoples walking together but apart. And that is a powerful image for us. It will be designed for wildlife. We're not designing for them. We're designing with them apart, that we walk separately, and yet we respect that right of passage, that pathway they choose. Um, that's a metaphorical image, of course, but it's a very powerful one to keep in mind in engaging in these community workshops that we do for design, to begin with the premise of respect and understanding. For farmers and ranchers, particularly in the Canadian and American West, where these roadways will traverse multiple large ranches, where we're talking about thousands of hectares, not a hundred. In this case, we managed to work with organizations like Yellowstone to Yukon Initiative that has pioneered something that we call cattle gates. So these are drop down gates that allow certain kinds of wildlife to move through their passageways, but not others. So, for example, pronghorn or ungulates, four-legged uh, creatures like you might call them antelopes. Uh, these are animals that have large roaming territories that need to move through ranches and farmers' ranches. But and the fences provide a barrier for them. If you can design a different type of gate 
you allow it to drop and allow these animals to move through and then come up again for uh, so that they have predator fences. So there are ways, I mean, these are design solutions that are negotiated with farming communities. In some areas, we have dropped uh, or put in place um, hunting regulations that you cannot hunt them. Other times, they're a very limited season for hunting, depends on the species. So this is not to say that this work takes place in a kind of idealistic vacuum. I can assure you that when you're dealing with top predators, the first and most important activity is public awareness on coexistence. You can follow uh, the work of the National Wildlife Federation and say LA Cougars. Online social media has a wonderful channel called um, they have like cougars that talks a lot about coexistence and they do public workshops on how Los Angelinos can coexist with mountain lions. Um, these are areas too, you'll see a lot of imagery on this website that'll blow your mind if you haven't already looked at it. These are doorbell camps that capture cougars moving through Brentwood Hills and through the Hollywood Hills. People taking out their trash and backing up quickly because there's a cougar walking down the street on the mountain lion. In their language. So these workshops are necessary. Um, they're also, I would say, really important at bridging cultural divides, particularly in Los Angeles, which has a long history of segregation between Black and white, Hispanic, Latino, and white people, um, where vulnerable communities are made vulnerable, they're economically marginalized, they've been cut off by the freeway. So there is a parallel conversation between re-engaging with wildlife and re-engaging with human communities that we've othered. In fact, we know from research that there's a paucity of data. We don't have any data on bird migration in certain communities because there was no public education in certain in redlined communities or communities that were racially segregated. Uh, they weren't given the opportunity for education and learning. So bringing that knowledge back into community is the first step in re-engaging. We, we cannot reasonably talk about how to engage with wolves and bears and coyotes unless we have community members who participate and understand what this means for them. So that is functionally and fundamentally the first step. It's a different lecture, but you'll understand that it's fundamental. <laughs> You're looking forward to the business. <laughs> I also have a question for you, right? because uh, yeah, we heard in the, in the institute where we teach uh, future designers and disciplines. So, what would be the role of design in this uh, perspective? So, can you elaborate? Do you mean beyond what I've shown here, yes. or do you mean in a studio setting? How? How do you mean? So, more the, so you can have a look uh, from an anthropological point of view, or from an ecological point of view, but you can also look at it from a designer. I, well, I would say that was fundamental to the studio with asking students to design. And from the designs, we were able to backwards kind of engineer, re engage the conversation about okay, well, what is this platform for? Do you expect to swim with a sea lion, or are you expecting to observe, or is it actually nothing to do with people at all? So by having students engage in the material work of design, we can unravel those questions of coexistence, not before they design, but as they're so, doing. So you use it as a, a means for getting a grip on the problem. Yeah, of course, absolutely. So we start with right away, what do you understand about this species? And let's do the desktop research. In two weeks, we did something called the species lens that I showed some examples from. And then from that, have the students really begin to understand and un let, let's say unpack and unravel the challenges of coexistence. Uh, in the community-based workshops, we don't teach anyone, the community teaches us what they know about particular species. In the Meadowway project that I showed in our community workshop, we had people attend who said, well, what do you mean by the meadow species? And we said, well, they mean pollinators, they mean bees, butterflies. Oh, wait, no, bees, they sting us. We, we can't talk about them. And we had to unpack, well, what does it mean? What types of bees do we mean? Are they ground nesting? They're not European honeybees. Those are not native to North America. We were talking about ground nesting bees, many of which don't sting. But the public perception is we can't talk about bees because they sting people, and that's a bad thing. We we found very early on that when we designed a meadow uh, condition on people's front yards, they they were worried about the snakes. They were very worried. It doesn't matter that there's only one venomous snake that's been pushed out of the area. 
it mattered that people had a public perception that snakes were evil, bad, poisonous, dangerous, ugly, slimy, right? So being able to participate in a public workshop as designers, they were able to say, well, let's look at a planting palette that minimizes your contact with a non-venomous snake and actually protects the snake population from you. So those were ways that the design team could engage directly with the questions of coexistence. For students, I think it's more important that they bring the direct lived experience and then unpack that uh, through the act of design, if that makes sense. Yeah, for sure. Thank you very much for your uh, great presentation and uh, nice to have you here with us again. I have a question on uh, I was uh, presented on the existing urban uh, Africa, and yet there was also a picture of Nairobi and of course in South America, India, cities are growing. Yeah. So looking to the 2030 uh, uh, goal, but can you say a bit more about how to protect those areas so that, well, basically, uh, six and we make the same mistakes all over again. And, uh, yeah, it's well, in a different direction, let's say, like that. Well, first of all, the palette of solutions is much larger. I have focused specifically here on connectivity through bridging and tunneling and at grade. If we included green roofs, living walls, bioswales, green streets, we have a much larger palette in meeting that sustainable development. I think goal 11, if we looked at putting life on land and life on water first, our infrastructures would look very different. And in my experience, limited though it is in Southeast Asia, some cities are far ahead of us, where there, there's already the opportunity, particularly in tropical countries. I mean, Singapore and nation state on an example to use sometimes, but lots of examples where the planting palette affords so many more opportunities. Um, certainly, Kong Shenzhou's work in China is also a great example at a larger scale and multiple scales where we're using blue and green infrastructure for the protection of other species as well as a human experience. So I think this, the palette of solutions is huge to draw on. I think we absolutely need, as Stefan set the table for us, much more interdisciplinary, even transdisciplinary work. I think our studios need to be much more open uh, to different disciplines. We need to be working with anthropologists, with storytelling in ways that we engage, certainly with the social um, benefits of biodiversity are critical. We're, I'm hearing more people doing work up in socially based nature-based solutions or social nature-based solutions where we're bringing the human mental and health benefits front and center to the table so that these larger selection of options in green infrastructure are part of the conversation. We're not going to get there, right, with just road bridges. Um, and we're not going to get there if the road bridges are poured with tons and tons of concrete for, for elephants. <laughs> we have to find much more vibrant, living, flexible materials to work with. We know they're there. We have not yet seen the political motivation to use them. I think 30 by 30 is a, is a huge motivation. It's also a barrier unless we see government investment. Um, this is why I've tried to work with public sector and private sector. I wish this was all in the public sector, but it's not that way. I mean, in my, my neighborhood, we could never raise $100 million for a crossing. Frankly, Hollywood was where it could be done. In India, China, other places, there may be other ways of raising money, particularly in, in the countries that have the fastest growing number of billionaires. Can we squeeze them for a little bit of cash? <laughs> Not really an answer, but a speculation. Okay. One more question. So this um, uh, I've heard you, uh, thank you for a very interesting lecture, first of all. Um, and uh, you've spent some time in the Netherlands. Do you plan uh, to do some research here or some project here? Do I plan? I mean, you must me what I like what I like to. If you would. If well, you actually, plan to. yeah, this particular trip, no, but the answer is yes. I have uh, some wonderful research partners here. In fact, when we began the ARC design competition in 2010, we had one of the finalist teams was Fratsen Jansma from the Netherlands, who brought, I would argue, a much more nuanced and advanced set of materials to the table that really informs the work that we do. We're still trying to get North Americans to take up those design solutions. And they really were 
uh, pioneer here in the Netherlands. So there's a lot to learn. Um, your species of wildlife are, of course, um, very different, and the landscape is much more urbanized. But that also provides opportunities. Um, I was very compelled by the last slide you showed, Stefan, on the kind of ways in which to engage with layers of history. We don't have, have those same landscapes, of course, in most of North America, but we do have indigenous landscapes, and that's a kind of history that I think we're trying to understand in a more nuanced and particular way. Thank you, Bert. So, well, and, uh, thank you very much for your great contribution. Please give her a hand.